we will now begin the assessment of the eyes. Now, before we begin this assessment, we're going to go ahead and gather the equipment we need for it. And what that all includes is the Snellen chart, which we have posted on the wall uh, right behind the camera here. Um, you could also use a Jaeger or Rosenbaum near vision chart as well, like this one here. Um, we will also need a pen light, which I have here, um, a cotton wisp, which I have here, an ophthalmoscope, which is here, and um, an eye cover. Um, when reading the Snellen chart, maybe you can even use your hand as well. Um, <clears throat> now, to begin this examination of the eye, we will first be testing um, visual. The vis we will first be testing visual acuity. Now, in order to do this, um, we will be testing three different things: distance vision, near vision, and peripheral vision. <clears throat> when we do this, we are actually testing the cranial nerve um, and measuring central vision. So, uh, to begin, uh, we will begin with distance vision. And uh, in patients that use eyeglasses, you want to ask them to go ahead and wear the glasses during this examination. You can also um, ask them or take a test without the glasses on. And if you decide to do that, you want to go ahead and take that test first and then go ahead and do it with the glasses on. In this case, this patient does use glasses. We're going to go ahead and skip the portion where we do not use the glasses and go ahead and ask him to place his glasses on and to read the smallest line on the Snellen chart that he is able to. L E F O D P C T. Okay, now if you'll go ahead and place the eye cover on your right and go ahead and try to read that same line with your left eye. L B F O D P C T. Okay, now try to go one line above that. D E F P O T H C. Try to go one line above that one. F-E-L-O-P-Z-D. Okay, now go ahead and put the same, remove your, your covered eye and go ahead and cover your other eye and try to read line six. E-D-F-C-Z-P. Okay. Okay, you can go ahead and remove that. <clears throat> now we go ahead and record um, our findings um, with using a fraction. Now the numerator of the fraction uh, measures how far away the patient is actually standing from the Snellen chart and in this case it is 20 feet. And on the denominator we go ahead and put the distance that any average person could actually read um, that particular line on the Snellen chart. Uh, the smaller the fraction they say the worse the vision. <clears throat> now um, whenever you have a patient reading off the Snellen chart, um, normally they'll go from left to right. In order to avoid a patient recalling um, the same letters on a line, you can ask them to go ahead when they, when they use their other eye to go ahead and read it backwards um, in order to ensure accuracy in your results. <clears throat> now, so we have completed the distance vision uh, testing. Now we're going to go ahead and go towards the near vision testing. Now with that one we use the uh, card here that we had mentioned earlier. Um, this is called the Rosenbaum um, near vision card. <clears throat> now we're going to ask the patient to place this about 35 centimeters or 14 inches away from his eyes um, <clears throat> and then to go ahead and once again, um, try to read the smallest line on that card. <laughs> F-A-X-T-D-N-H-U-P-Z. Okay, now try to go one line above that one. X-D-F-H-P-T-Z-A-N. <laughs> okay, now we're going to ask him to cover one eye. <clears throat> and then we're going to ask him to go ahead and read the smallest line that he can. F X. T D N H U P Z. Now try to go one line above that one. <laughs> X D F H P T Z A N. Okay, now go ahead and cover your other eye and attempt to read the smallest line. <laughs> F A X T D N H U P Z. Okay, very good. So as you can see, um, there have been times when there has been an error when he has been reading the letters, and we asked them to go ahead and read the one above 
to, because what you're looking for is that they're able to read every single letter in accuracy that is on the chart. <coughs> now, so we have completed the distance vision and the near vision. Now we're going to go ahead and uh, test peripheral vision. Now, uh, to test peripheral vision, we are going to use something called a confrontation test. In this test, we are going to be, the examiner is going to be sitting straightly across from the, from the patient, and you are going to begin to test peripheral um, vision, um, uh, visual fields. So in this case, we are going to sit at eye level across from each other. Now, both the examiner and the patient are going to use uh, the blinds for your eyes. And in this examination, um, you, whichever eye that you cover will be the opposite one that the patient covers. So in this case, I'm going to cover my right eye and he is going to cover his left eye. Now I'm going to ask him to go ahead and tell me when he begins to see my hands. And we are going to test uh, both the nasal, the temporal, superior, and inferior visual fields. <clears throat> and I will demonstrate this. <clears throat> Whenever I see my fingers in my visual field, he should be able to see them at the same time. Now, we also have to um, take into consideration that the brow and the nose may cover our vision. So uh, we may be able to see better when coming uh, down up and from my left side, for example, than when I'm coming from my right side, just because of the nose and the brow. So let's go ahead and do this. Now I'm going to go ahead and bring up my hand over to the side, and you tell me when you begin to see my fingers see wiggle. It. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and bring it from the other side. See it. You see it. Okay. Now I'm going to bring it from the top. See it. And from the bottom. See it. Okay. And then we're going to go ahead, and in the examination you would repeat the other side, but we'll go ahead and skip through that one. <coughs> now, <coughs> so that was how we tested <coughs> the peripheral vision. Now, we're going to go ahead and, with continuing to test visual, uh, our, vis our, our vision, I'm sorry, uh, we're going to go ahead and continue and, um, th and, and test the color. Um, that we, we know uh, the appropriate colors, that we're able to identify, I'm sorry, uh, the primary colors. Um, this is a test that is rarely um, considered. Um, however, uh, we will go ahead and, and demonstrate this as well. So in this um, color vision test, we use something called color plates. Now, <clears throat> although we do not have anything to show at this time, um, I will describe what that is. So uh, the patient is normally given a paper that has um, the, the numerals uh, with in, in primary colors on it and then surrounding it other numbers with confusing colors around it. So uh, the patient is asked to <clears throat> read off the numbers that they see in certain colors. Um, <clears throat> now they say that in something that they call um, uh, red testing, if the patient is not able to identify the red uh, numerals, they determine that they, he may have an optic nerve disease. <coughs> they say that a red defect is associated with afferent pupillary defect. <coughs> now, um, now that we have gone over the color, let's go ahead and move on to the external eye examination. <coughs> now with the external eye, um, I will ask him to go ahead and remove his glasses. <clears throat> now, you want to go ahead and inspect and, uh, and palpate also um, the portions of the eyes that we see here for any <clears throat> abnormalities. We will begin from the top to the bottom. So, as you can see here, <clears throat> we're checking his eyebrows. We're making sure that the size <clears throat> is um, correct that the brow isn't too short or too long and in this case it's not <clears throat> we're making sure that it doesn't extend um, beyond the eye or or ends too short of it um, we're looking for the hair texture um, also note that patients sometimes do pluck their eyebrows or shave them so this is an, this is normal um, <clears throat> if the hair texture of the eyebrows is coarse and it doesn't extend beyond the canvas and it actually is a little shorter, 
it could be indicative of hypothyroidism. So that's important to know. Now, <clears throat> we'll also, we, we've completed the, the examination of the eyebrows. Now we'll go a little further down. We're now looking at the orbital area. <clears throat> now this area is the area around the eye. So when we look at the orbital and periorbital areas, we're looking to see if we see any edema, any puffiness, or sagging tissue below the orbit. Now, um, sometimes <clears throat> we may have puffiness because with age, um, our tissue does get less elastic. So we may, may see some puffiness there. However, whenever you see edema, anytime you see edema in the periorbital or orbital areas, you must know that that is an abnormal finding. <clears throat> in order to do this, you need to kind of palpate around the eye to see if you feel anything abnormal there, any edema. Now, if you do have edema around the eye, um, normally that is indicative of some type of eye disease. It could be allergies. Um, and when you have young ones that have this finding, uh, that could be indicative of a renal disease. <clears throat> um, as far as the, the sagging tissue that we were talking about, now you will note that some people, sometimes when you see them, they'll have these lesions around their eyes, normally in the inner campus, and it, they're yellow, oval, they may be irregularly shaped, they may be flat, they may be raised, um, <clears throat> but that is indicative of a, a, a lipid metabolism disorder that they call um, xanthelasma and um, <clears throat> they're just a development of plaque deposited in the macrophages around the eye and that's why they look that yellow um, oval uh, uh, irregularly shaped uh, type of lesion <clears throat> now moving on we're going to take a look at the eyelids now we're going to go ahead and ask him to close his eyes for a minute <clears throat> now when we ask him to close his eyes we want him to lightly close his eyes don't ask the patient to squeeze just yet. So when we, when we have him close his eyes, we're looking to see if there's any tremors or fasciculations there. Because if he does have tremors, this could be indicative of hyperthyroidism. So in this case, it doesn't look like anything exaggerative. <clears throat> so this, is, this, is, this would be a normal finding. Now I'm going to ask him to go ahead and close his eyes very tight. Okay, we're looking for symmetry here. We're looking that he's able to do that. Now we're going to ask him to open his eyes very, very wide. Open his eyes very wide. Okay. <laughs> okay. So these are all normal findings that he's actually able to close them and open them. But the muscles around the eyes of the nerves are intact. <clears throat> now, we're looking at the eyelids at the margins in particular. We're wanting to see if there's any flakiness, redness, swelling anything like that along where the, eye, where the eyelashes protrude. And in this case, this would be a normal finding. There is nothing of that sort on there. <clears throat> I will explain in more detail why we look for those things. Now, the eyelashes. We want to make sure that these are curved outward, <clears throat> uh, away from the globe. Um, uh, and in this case, they are. So this would be a normal finding. Um, moreover, we want to see the position of the upper eyelid. <clears throat> now, we want to look also for symmetry in this case. So we would look directly at the patient and we would see, we would see if there was one eyelid that maybe droops a little bit more than the other over the iris or maybe sometimes even the pupil. Now, normally <clears throat> in patients, you will see um, that the they measure um, how far the, the eyelid droops over the iris um, in millimeters, and they measure it from what they call the limbus, um, the upper and the lower limbus. Now the upper limbus would be where the sclera and the conjunctiva um, come together and unite, <clears throat> which would be the part, uh, top portion of where the color starts of the eye. So in this case, um, if, if you note here, we do not see um, the conjunctiva when he is not opening his eyes very wide. So that is a normal finding. And his upper eyelid doesn't cover the pupil at all, which is a normal finding. Now, if you would see a patient, and uh, sometimes you'll find that some patients on one eye, 
um, the, the upper eyelid will cover some of the iris a little more than the other one, sometimes even covering the pupil itself, um, making it hard to, to see well through that eye. So <clears throat> these are all things that we would be looking for when measuring the upper eyelid position. <clears throat> now, whenever you see that happen, sometimes the reason for that happening for some patients is one of two things. Either it's the muscle itself, which we call the levator muscle. Sometimes that one's just a little weak and it may be from, con from a, a congenital abnormality or maybe it just got weak over time. <clears throat> now, another reason that could happen would be the actual nerve is the one that's defective. And maybe it's, it's got some paresis there. And uh, in a, the nerve that actually um, uh, takes control of that muscle would be cranial nerve three. So <clears throat> it could be any one of those two things. Um, now let's move on and we'll talk about um, the eyelids and uh, different findings of what they call eversion and inversion. Now, <clears throat> When we, when we uh, take a look at the eyelids, um, we want to make sure um, that they're not inverted and moving in towards the eye and they are not, um, uh, what do they call it, everted. So <clears throat> in some cases you'll see uh, sometimes that the lower eyelid is kind of drooping outward like this. And that's, a, that's something that you would call uh, ectropion. Now, ectropion, the reason why um, that affects the eye is the fact that the, the duct, the lacrimal duct, um, is actually pulled outward. Uh, it's called the punctum. It's actually moved outward. And uh, patients normally suffer from increased tearing. And the reason for that being is that the duct isn't able to capture those tears and send them through the lacrimal duct. Um, and it, they, just, they just become very, very tearful and nothing catches those tears. Um, in other cases, there are some individuals that have their eyelids that kind of curve inward here in the inner campus. And they normally state that they constantly feel irritated, like something's in their eye, and that's because their eyelashes are constantly hitting up on, um, on their cornea, on their conjunctiva, and it, 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 it's irritating. Um, and sometimes, because of this, uh, they, they do develop secondary infections from that. Now, <clears throat> another thing that you want to take a look at um, that I had mentioned earlier is just the area where their eyelashes come out from. Um, do you see any abnormalities there? Do you see any crusting, any, like I said earlier, any flaking redness, um, in particular any styes? Um, <clears throat> now, sometimes whenever you see that they have like crusting uh, in that sort of way, um, we normally call that uh, blepharitis. Now, blepharitis can normally uh, be associated with uh, a bacterial infection, um, it could be allergic in origin or be from some type of skin condition like psoriasis um, that, would be need to, that would need to be uh, further assessed. Now, <clears throat> well, now we're going to ask the patient um, to go ahead and close his eyes once more. And as we can tell, his eyelid does cover the whole globe of his eye. Um, sometimes there are some patients that are unable um, to close the eyelid over the whole eye, and that is something that we call uh, lagophthalmus. Um, and these patients normally uh, say that they feel that their cornea is very dry, and this could also be another cause for infection. Um, the last thing on the eyelids that we want to look at is uh, palpation of them. So you want to go ahead and palpate the eyelids, and what you're feeling for is that there isn't any anything uh, hard there, um, such as like a nodule or anything like that. Um, and you're also kind of feeling for the eye. You're going to kind of press up on it. Now, if you feel that the eye is very hard, normally that could be indicative of maybe glaucoma. Um, sometimes it could be that uh, he has uh, hyperthyroidism or a retro uh, bulbar tumor. Uh, something is causing the eye to to um, to not be mobile in that manner. 
Now, <clears throat> also, if the patient is stating that he has pain when you do this, when you try to push it in, just gently, just gently, um, it could also be that he may have an infection or maybe have throm uh, thrombosis um, in his eye. So those are things to take a look for. Um, now, let's go ahead and inspect the conjunctivae of the eye. Now, uh, normally, you won't, you won't uh, check the, you won't inspect the upper uh, portion of the conjunctivae unless the patient states that there's a foreign body present there. Um, but let's start with the, with the lower. So in order to do this, very, very easy, you're only going to press downward here on the eye. Go ahead and open your eye. And you're going to press downward so that you can see that uh, white part of the eye there. So <clears throat> when you do this, um, you're just making sure that um, Again, that there's no redness, swelling, or, or anything abnormal in the conjunctivae. That there, it's clear there's no erythema or exudate anywhere. Now, like I said before, the upper eye, you would only do that if, if they say that they've got something in their eye. You want to make, the, make sure it's not, there's nothing there. So when, it, when you do this, um, you, you would just uh, ask the patient to look down, and then you would go ahead and uh, pull the eyelashes down and forward using a Q-tip and evert that uh, eyelid so that you would, you would be able to, to uh, remove that foreign body with a cotton tip or anything like that. So <clears throat> now moving forward, um, if the conjunctiva um, has an abnormal growth, uh, sometimes you'll find that They'll have uh, an extension of the conjunctivae going over the cornea there. And um, that is normally called something uh, that we say is uh, uh, pterygium. Um, and this can cause uh, vision problems as well. Um, but that would be something that you would, uh, you would want to further assess if you, if you see something like that. Now moving forward to the cornea. Now, the cornea itself, um, it's, it is an avascular portion of the eye, so you won't see blood vessels there. Um, and the first thing we want to look for is clarity. Now, the first thing we want to do is uh, we're going to shine a light. Um, we're going to go ahead and, no, go ahead and stay forward. We're going to go ahead and shine a light uh, tangentially. Okay, and what we're looking for is to make sure that it's clear, that the cornea is clear. Um, now, something that sometimes we may see in individuals that are over the age of 60 is they have a buildup of lipids around the eye that make it make the the peripheral portion of the cornea uh, look like it's got a like a. a like a subtle clear area there, it's more opaque around the edges, um, and they call that a corneal arc um, or circle. Now, uh, some individuals who are uh, younger than the age of 40 who sometimes have that, but those are all indicative of uh, hyperlipid hyperlipidemia or lipid deposits around the cornea. Um, <clears throat> now, the second thing we want to test with the cornea is um, sensitivity. Now, when we do this, we're testing uh, cranial nerve 5. Now, if I touch the cornea with a cotton tip and the patient blinks, you know that the nerve is intact. If they do not, then you know that you have a problem. And most of the time, it's associated with a herpes simplex infection. So, I'm not going to go ahead and touch it at this point, but you would just touch it here and then the patient would blink. See, I didn't even touch it yet and he was already blinking. <laughs> okay, now we're going to move forward to see um, and test the iris and pupil. Now, the iris and the pupil. The iris is uh, the colored portion um, around the eye and uh, the pupil is actually the black portion right in the center there. So. The, clear, the, the iris itself, um, as you can see, is clearly visible. Uh, you want to make sure that the color of the iris is the same on both sides. 
Um, next thing you want to look for is the pupil size and the shape. Those are very important and I'll, and I'll explain why later. But you need to make sure that they are round, that they are regular, and that they are equal. So in this case, they are. Now sometimes you'll see um, a condition that, that they call meiosis. Now in meiosis, you'll see that the pupils are less than two millimeters in size and they are constricted and they do not move. Now, this is very, very important to note because patients that come in with meiosis, um, normally that finding is associated with uh, use of narcotics or, or you know, uh, in other not, not so severe cases, uh, patients with glaucoma use drugs that create that, that um, symptom. Now, on the other hand, you have um, uh, a finding where the pupils are dilated over six millimeters and they do not react to uh, light. And in this case, they would call it midriasis. And in midriasis, um, often that finding is associated with uh, possibly, again, glaucoma, where pa patients use eye drops that have atropine in them or the patients are in a coma from some um, systemic disease. So um, all those pu pupil reaction um, and pupil size, uh, those are all very, very important findings uh, in determining and diagnosing a patient uh, that comes in. They'll tell you a lot um, from that. So moreover, um, you also wanna test the response of the pupil to light. Um, we do it what they call directly and then also consensually. Now, when I say directly, I'm looking at the eye itself that I'm actually putting the light on to make sure that when I put the light on that eye that it does constrict. Now, when I say consensually, I continue to put the light on that eye, but I'm looking at the other eye to see if it's also constricting as well because it's supposed to be constricting at the same time. Now. We're going to go ahead and do that now. What you want to do is have the patient in somewhat of a dim room. And then using a light, <clears throat> you'll go ahead and ask him to look straight forward at some fixed object. And then you're going to come around and you're going to go ahead and see how both eyes do constrict at the same time. And as I move the flashlight away, or the pen light away, they go ahead and dilate once more. Now, the reason we dim the room is so we can go ahead and have them dilate and see the, the change in the size um, a little more clearly. So, we were able to see that you would do that with both sides to make sure that, that the both uh, do the same thing. Now, there is another test called the swinging flashlight test. Now, this is where we shine just like we did the light in one eye but then we click, quickly shine it on the other one and we go back and forth. Now, we need to make sure that the second eye that we flash the light on uh, does not continue to dilate as this would be a finding of an afferent pupillary defect um, that would be indicative of an optic nerve disease. Um, normally, you'll see this in patients that have poor vision um, or have um, severe uh, retinal disease. So in this case, I'll quickly demonstrate. We'll go ahead and ask him to look straight forward once again. And then we'll go from one eye to the other eye. One eye to the other eye. Just like that. And in his case, they were continuing to constrict every time I did. Once we are done doing that, we'll go ahead and test accommodation. Now, once again, we'll ask the patient to look at a distant object like we did before. And then um, we'll go ahead and, for example, place another object about 10 centimeters from, in, from his nose and then ask him to look at the distant object and then to look at the object that is closer to him and uh, to see if the pupils constrict. So we'll go ahead and test this now. We'll go ahead and ask him to go ahead and look over at uh, the E on the Snellen chart. And then I'm going to position my finger right in front of him. And then we're going to go ahead and ask him to look at my finger. Okay. So what I saw there is his, uh, his eyes dilated when he was looking at the Snellen chart. When he looked at my finger, they accommodated and they became smaller so that he can see what was right in front of them. 
So that would be a normal finding. Um, the only time you would really use accommodation is only if uh, you see a defect in the response of the pupils to light, uh, as we did in the earlier test. If you see a, a finding that is abnormal there, then it, that that would be indic or uh, that would be warranted for a, for an accommodation test like the one we just did. Um, if the patient you find is not able to accommodate, as we saw with the pupil changes. Um, these could be significant for uh, or associated with diseases such as diabetes mellitus or syphilis. So th that's important to know. Now um, we'll go. We'll continue to look at the lens. Now the lens itself, you can put um, the light in to see the lens, and it should appear uh, either a gray or a yellow with the light. But you just want to make sure that it is transparent, okay? So his is appearing a little uh, gray. So that's, that, that's what you want to see. Now the sclera is the next thing we're going to be looking at. And that is, uh, you're just making sure that the sclera itself all around the eye is white and um, is visible above the iris. So in this case, we would ask the patient to look down and we could see it there. So we're able to see it above the iris um, or we can ask him to open his eyes real wide. And you're taking a look to make sure that it is white and not any other color. Sometimes when the sclera comes up yellow or green, this could be indicative of either liver disease or maybe even a hemolytic disease. So that's important too. Now, the next thing we're going to be uh, examining is the lacrimal apparatus. Now, we have something called a puncta, and that is where the tears go um, down and drain um, uh, so, uh, into the nasopharynx. So, um, when we're taking a look at the lacrimal apparatus to make sure that there's no abnormalities in it, we want to make sure that... Um, that there are no slight elevations, um, that there are no abnormalities when looking here, like in, in the inner canthus. You want to palpate that. Now, in order to determine where the actual punctum is, you'll see slight elevations on the nasal side, uh, on the upper and lower uh, lids. And, they're, and you can tell here, they're very, very slight. You don't want them to be very prominent. And then you would go ahead and palpate to make sure that you don't see that he has um, any enlarged uh, places there. So here, over on the side here, is actually where the lacrimal gland is. Now if you feel that any portion is actually elevated or maybe is a little more puffy, has more edema, then you would want to go ahead and examine that gland by everting that eyelid and taking a look at it. It should not be enlarged. So when we're done looking at that uh, lacrimal apparatus and examining that, we want to go ahead and begin examining the next, uh, the next thing, which is uh, extraocular muscle movements. Now, extraocular muscles, there's six of them in total, and um, they are controlled by the cranial nerves three, four, and six. Now, there's four different techniques that we use in order to test these muscles. And the first, thing we're, the first one we're going to do is uh, the six cardinal fields of gaze. Now, with that one, basically what we want to do is we're going to use our finger. Now, we're going to ask the patient to turn towards me. And then we're going to ask him to follow the finger. Okay, so go ahead and follow my finger wherever it goes. That'd be one, two, don't try not to move your head, three, four. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So what you're testing in this is to make sure that he doesn't have any nystagmus. So when you move your eyes from, when he moves his eyes from side to side, that they don't jerk and twitch. And I mean, sometimes they will, and this is not abnormal, um, as long as they're not a sustained twitch. Um, so that, 
you know, if, if you see a sustained twitch, that's the only time that it would be abnormal. Now, <clears throat> we're also going to, we're also going to do the, um, Remember what it is. Ah, uh, I hate.